Hey everybody, you are now tuned into The Blackout, shining a light on black excellence, activism, and culture. Blacked out by the majority on Afro Vibes Radio, the number one online internet radio station with your girl, Tequila. Today's special guest will be speaking at the Pan-African Libraries Meeting of the Minds Soweto Uprising for Youth Month in partnership with said country head of brand South Africa, Mr. Mudu Wanzi. And I hope I said that correctly. <laughs> no, 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 you did. Good. Thank you so much for coming on our show today. I know that you're going to be speaking this evening at the event. So before you get into that, tell us a little bit about you being the the country of the head brand, as well as um, the partnerships that you've made with the organization Mm -hmm. and representation for South Africa. No, no. Thank you very much, Tequila, and and good afternoon to your listeners as well. Indeed, uh, as Brand South Africa, we were initially formed by the South African government as an official agency that's responsible for marketing South Africa as a nation brand, uh, telling the South African story, its competitiveness, but beyond that, just managing the reputation of the country. Uh, One of the things that we then discovered earlier on as South Africa is that uh, there was no coherent message coming out of the advent of democracy in 1994. Uh, Each time a South African will travel abroad, will tell the South African story from their own perspective. Uh, And and the then deputy president of the country, President Tabombeki, formed what was then called the International Marketing Council uh, with the responsibility to tell the South African story to our stakeholders uh, globally. Uh, Over time, of course, our mandate evolved to also include a domestic uh, responsibility, which was that of uh, making sure that uh, social cohesion becomes part of this by educating our own people, uh, that it's important for them to become brand ambassadors, that wherever they travel, uh, they also need to tell the good uh, news that are coming out of South Africa. So we now have um, presence in the US, Uh, in New York, where I'm based, and I'm responsible for the US office as the country head. We also have an office in London. We have an office in in Beijing. Uh, We we are also planning to open in Brazil, India, and Russia. Uh, But at the present moment, we work through PR agencies, uh, also in markets where we don't have warm bodies, uh, like here in the US. So we are here to to tell that South African story as brand South Africa, and we do that through several campaigns, uh, you know, such as creating partnerships with organizations such as SAID, uh, Pan African Library, uh, and utilize this platform to reach out to uh, Africans uh, in the diaspora, South Africans in the diaspora, as well as those that regard themselves as friends of South Africa. Uh, to say, look, um, we all need to put our hands on the deck in terms of changing the perceptions in in, in the manner in which we are reported on by uh, mainstream media as well as how we are perceived as nation states, especially in Africa. Uh, we, We know that there's still that challenge that a lot of people are unable to distinguish between uh, individual sovereign states in Africa. They look at Africa as just one country. Yeah. Uh, they don't know that there's over 50 uh, sovereign states that exist there. And and part of what we do uh, as, 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 as Brand South Africa based in the US, we then educate people about some of these, um, you know, uh, nuances uh, in, 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 in marketing ourselves. And, and we're also responsible for uh, promoting uh, investment and trade uh, mm-hmm. between South Africa and 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 and, and this market. Uh, so yeah, so so what brings us to Houston is that we have entered into this partnership that I've alluded to with Said Pan African Library, that uh, we seek to then celebrate uh, the Youth Month in South Africa, mm-hmm. uh, the Soweto Uprising of June 1976. Uh, which actually is characterized as one of the bloodiest uh, uprising in the history of South Africa. Mm. Uh, and we want to then talk to the young people um, of African descent who are based in, in Houston and surrounding uh, cities to say, 
The youth of 1976 carried their baton. Uh, it's up to the modern day youth now to then define their responsibility uh, and, and pick up the baton, which was left by the likes of Tsietsi Mashinini, who was just 19 years old when he led the Soweto uh, uprising. Um, and, and we're saying there are certain things that it will take uh, for a modern day era young Tsietsi Mashinini to be able to thrive in a, in, in, in a society as well as uh, an economy that, that is globalizing. Um, and, and that is also underpinned by changes in technology mm -hmm. uh, with the ushering in of the fourth industrial revolution as we speak. Yeah. Absolutely. And for those who may not be familiar, kind of tell us what actually um, led up to the Soweto uprising in South Africa. Look, look uh, it, for us, it, the Soweto not only serves as a reminder of that selfless uh, bravery, uh, of our youth, uh, which happened 43 years ago to be precise, but also reminds us that actions motivated by yesterday, taken today, have the potential to set the future of our tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So if one is bold enough, one can change not only the course of history, but also the course of the future. So this is what actually uh, inspires us as, as, as South Africans, but also the message that we want to, to sort of uh, inculcate in, in the young people of today. Um, for one to understand actually what led to that uprising, one needs to understand uh, the political mood of the time. Uh, that led the 1976 generation to, to arrive at, uh, you know, causing this uh, uprising. Uh, it was the time of the Black Consciousness Movement, which was led by Steve Biggo. Uh, so there was a lot of political awakening at mm -hmm. the time. Uh, and then it was also the time when the African National Congress, ANC, which is currently the governing party in South Africa, was facing major challenges. Its leadership, the likes of Nelson Mandela, Walter Sisulu, and others were in jail. Mm -hmm. And Oliver Tambo and others, such as Yusuf Dadu, were in exile. Um, and, 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 and of course, it, it created difficulties. But then you then had an announcement by the then Minister of Education, Dr. Andris Trenek, um, who then uh, announced that black students need to start to learn in Afrikaans. Afrikaans is a Dutch dialect. Um, um, it's, it's very far from English, uh, as it were. Um, and, but because it, it was a compulsory thing, uh, a language at the time, uh, a lot of black people speak Afrikaans. I speak a little bit of it. Uh, because I don't practice it anymore, uh, you know, it, I'm a bit rusty now. Um, but it was the announcement that English will no longer serve as a major uh, language or medium of instruction in, in schools, in high schools, mm -hmm. primary schools, universities, and all that. That then led the young people to say, no, 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 enough is enough. Uh, and, and we're saying it sparked that uh, uprising because partly because the socio-economic conditions for the majority of black people were already appalling at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, people were living in squatter camps, uh, which, yeah, I think you call them shanty towns and all that. Um, and people were not allowed to live in suburbs. People were not allowed to own businesses and so forth and so on. And I'm talking black people in the main. Uh, but then the other thing was, it was also the time of the implementation of what we call the Bantu stand policy, which then created fictitiously the so-called independent states within South Africa. Yeah. So you had Transkai, Buptatswana, Venda, and Siskai, the TBVC, the four uh, states, who for some reason they were supposed to be independent, self-governing within South Africa. Um, what that was all about, it was simply just a policy to balkanize black people along mm -hmm. ethnic lines. 
So, so you, you, you had all that taking place. And then at the same time, then you had the consolidation of the Bantu education for black people. And, and here we are saying black people were afforded inferior education compared to what was being offered to white people, to white kids. And, and all these things then sparked this, this, this revolution. Uh, and, and, and this uprising within South Africa, which was led by Tsietsi Mashinyini, who was at the time a 19-year-old chap. So, so you can imagine the anger uh, amongst youth people who were prepared to face the brutal apartheid regime um, with its guns and all that, to say, no, we prepare to die. Uh, yeah. Now I have a question. With Africa having <coughs> such a rich culture, here we basically assume or believe that it's major majorly covered with black people. Yeah. How has it gotten to a point where Europeans have came in and start putting in these discriminatory laws against the people that have already been there? Well, I think uh, it, it, it started for South Africa in particular. It started with uh, the policy of uh, subjugation. Uh, as well as this possession. Mm. Uh, we currently are contending uh, through parliament uh, with issues around uh, land dispossession. Yeah. So that's how it started, uh, moving black people from fertile lands and put them in these dry areas. Kind of like gentrification here? Gentrification, yeah. you would call it here, yeah. Um, and, and, and of course, stealing their assets and so forth and so on. Mm. And then looking at them as just sources of labor, wow. you know, uh, for the mines, the gold that was discovered in 1886, for instance, in Johannesburg. That's why Gauteng, which is the city, it means, simply means city of gold, mm -hmm. uh, because that's where the first gold mines were discovered in South Africa and all that. And you had that uh, uh, movement uh, by the Afrikaners uh, who wanted to exploit uh, this new found wealth. Uh, within South Africa. And, and as a result of that, they needed labor and they started conquering, uh, you know, the inhabitants. And of course, there are wars that were fought, uh, you know, the war of Isindrani, even the war that was led by uh, Shaka Zulu and others, uh, just to defend themselves against the invaders uh, as they looked at them at the time. Uh, because you must remember, uh, these people didn't just come and say, no, 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 get out of here, we want your land and all that. They, they came under false pretenses. Mm. Yeah. And then when our people, being um, friendly people and accepting people, um, accepted them, embraced them, then, then they started showing their true colors. And of See, course, they also a, had the mighty of the gun. That's been a, a pattern I've noted, noticed throughout history, just mm. even like with slavery in America. Yeah. From what I've learned, they came in to learn the culture, learn yeah. spirituality, mm. and then they captured those same people and took them back for, like you said, labor, free labor. Exactly. That seems to be like an ongoing trend. Do you, do you probably have a, a reason why you think they're so adamant about taking from the black culture? Look, I, 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 I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. I don't have a specific reason, uh, but I, I suspect we we also we are also too trusting as black people, mm. uh, and and also the fact that in, in most instances um, we tend to want to stand as single individuals. Uh, the reason why currently there's this divide, conquer, and rule, mm. even within Africa of today, it, it's partly because as a united Africa, it will be very difficult for Europeans or Americans to come and dictate to us mm. uh, and take from us. And, and that is the policy, this tactic that they also used at the time of, of just approaching us as individual tribes and so forth and so on and turn us against each other mm -hmm. uh, uh, because some of the slaves that we the, the stories that we read about of how slaves were captured you find that it was a, a king of another tribe raiding uh, another tribe for for their strong men and women uh, for that matter
Yeah. Well, I want to get more into it in the second half, but we got to go to a quick commercial break. Thank you guys for still tuning in with us. As we go to the commercial break, we will return shortly, but you guys are still listening to The Blackout, shining a light on black excellence, activism, and culture on Afro Vibes Radio with your girl, Tequila. Hey, everybody, you are now tuned back into the blackout, shining a light on black excellence, activism, and culture. Blacked out by the majority on Afro Vibes Radio, the number one online internet radio station with your girl, Tequila. We are currently still in the studio with the lovely Mr. Mundunwazi Baloyi. I hope I said that right. He's the country head for the brand South Africa. And again, he will be at the event tonight in Houston, hosted by the Pan African Library for the celebration of the Soweto Uprising. Yeah. So um, as we were talking in the first portion of the show, you were giving us a lot of historical uh, background on what happened during the Soweto uprising. Mm -hmm. And so to get into the youth month, uh, two things. First, let's find out why are we um, celebrating the youth month? And two, what do you want to happen or transpire with today's South African youths here in America as well, back, back home in South Africa and how they can follow this uprising? Look, for, for, for us, the reason why we say we need to uh, celebrate this thing, we need to inspire the 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 new generation, uh, the 1976 generation. They ran their race, and they have handed over their baton. Uh, and we're saying for for the 2000s um, uh, going forward. Mm-hmm. What is it that they, they would like to achieve? What is it that they would like to do? And, and I'm reminded of a quote uh, by Franz Fanon uh, from his book, The Richard World. Uh, it, it says that each generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. And we know that uh, the 1976 generation discovered their mission which was to challenge the apartheid regime system. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they ran their race. And we saw massive changes uh, throughout the landscape of South Africa. Uh, what the apartheid government had sought to implement was never implemented uh, because they were challenged and successfully so, mm-hmm. despite the fact that a lot of young people died uh, during that process. Uh, paid with their lives. Uh, So we are looking for the modern day 1976 generation now to say, what is it that you would like to do? What is your mission? And and of course, uh, we are saying this thing has to happen uh, taking into account the realities that we are facing today as nation states, that we are no longer uh, operating in silos. We are in a global environment. Uh, Economies are integrating, as it were, through trade, uh, through technologies, and and many other things. And and we are also uh, faced with uh, the implementation of the fourth industrial revolution. And we know from history that those that have refused these industrial revolutions, uh, the past three industrial revolutions, Each time a revolution will come upon us, there will be men and women who will stand up and say, but we can't accept this. Uh, We think we want to maintain the status quo. Uh, They were put aside. People marched on. Um, And of course, we are now sitting uh, with this advent of the fourth industrial revolution, which actually is nothing else but the confluence of advancement of digital, robotics and biological technologies, and it is catalyzed by artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence simply means that it's technology that makes machines intelligent. Mm -hmm. Uh, We now have selfless uh, drive cars. We have um, airplanes that can also fly without pilots, on autopilot, and so forth and so on. That's what artificial intelligence is all about. And, and this is what underpins the fourth industrial revolution that has confronted us now. And, and, and the modern day 
Nazi and, and the 1976 generation of today uh, will need to be able to embrace these developments. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and of course, if you allow me, there are certain things that uh, will be required. They need to be very, very educated. Education underpins all these things. And this is what the likes of Tietzi Machinini in South Africa in 1976 were fighting for, to say we need good quality education. Education that will equip us for the future, but not uh, uh, for, for labor, mm -hmm. uh, as it were, and so forth and so on. So you will need somebody who is a critical thinker. Uh, because the era of memorizing things has gone past with these technologies that are, are upon us. And you need somebody who's a problem solver, mm -hmm. not somebody who then repeat work. But you need somebody who, when they are confronted with difficult situations, they're able to come up with problems, I mean with solutions. You need somebody who's creative, you know, because copying other people's work is now a thing of the past. People are looking for creative people, even in workplaces. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and the U.S. has been at the forefront of some of these things that I'm talking about because it doesn't matter what you have studied uh, in college in, in America. You can, you can study liberal arts, but then you can work uh, on Wall Street as an investment banker because, because all these things are trainable. Uh, what they're looking for is somebody who's creative, somebody who's, who's a critical thinker, somebody who can learn fast and so forth and so on. And we also need people who are able to coordinate things because uh, workforces now are diverse and creative. Uh, it's no longer an individual effort. Mm -hmm. This day we talk about crowdfunding, for instance, uh, which is crowds coming together. Uh, to, to contribute money or, or staff uh, towards a particular cause. So it's no longer an individual effort because we have come to learn that uh, actually it takes a village to, to just quote uh, the African adage, to raise a child, as, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and emotional intelligence is at the center of this thing as well, uh, that uh, teams are diverse and creative, so you need somebody who's matured emotionally. Uh, ability to preempt as well the harmful and unintended consequences of some of these technologies. Uh, robots, for instance, we need to know uh, what are the unintended consequences of these things. So that we, when we embrace these things, at least we have options as well, you know? Uh, and, and as I said, that you need young people who, on continuous basis, uh, engage themselves in learning. And I'm talking for me, the learning in particular, you know, because education is not something that you can finish. Uh, you know, you learn throughout your life. Um, and But we also need people with a global mindset uh, instead of just narrow nationalism. And we have seen this tendency now of n nationalism also emerging in this country, uh, where it's America, America first, America first. Uh, and forgetting that uh, America does not exist uh, in isolation. Uh, it's not an island on its own. And, and this is a lesson that we have also taken to heart as South Africa, that uh, South Africa's fortunes are intertwined with the advancement of the rest of the African continent. So whatever we do, we also always make sure that we are aligned to our brothers and sisters uh, in the continent. And, and lastly, if you allow me, it has to be someone who's also grounded in their community. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody who understand the community problems and always seek uh, ways to resolve those. Uh, innovative uh, ways of, of, of coming up with, with, with solutions. And, and here, being innovative <coughs> will also relate to, we need to be able to conduct research. Because research leads to innovation. Innovation leads to intellectual property. Mm -hmm. Intellectual property leads to products and services that we see now being offered. And that is the main thing that uh, as Africans 
in the diaspora and Africans in Africa, uh, we are not playing an active role in. Uh, we are always partakers, consumers of technologies that are developed elsewhere. Mm. You know, instead of being participants and become subjects in these things. Uh, so we always want to be objects. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. That was very enlightening. As we're getting closer towards the end of our show, for tonight's event at the Pan-African Library for the Soweto Uprising, what are you um, actually hoping that your audience is going to receive from your message and from your speech? And what are some of the things that you're hoping that you can speak to them about tonight? Look, for, for us, is the clarion call that we seek to make is that uh, our youth need uh, to become a new breed of activists, which will then contribute to the attainment of some of these advancements, like the fourth industrial revolution that I've alluded to. Um, you know, uh, I'll give an example to that. For instance, when Google Maps, for instance, uh, mispronounce our names, our street names, uh, there has to be a young people sitting somewhere who will then come up with a company, with a solution, or with an internet uh, solution, and then run a program that is able to pronounce our names and our streets uh, correctly. Mm. Uh, and, and these are some of the things that we're saying are opportunities out there, but then it requires, uh, the basis of this, it requires investment in education. That's why we need all of us to demand good education mm -hmm. wherever we are based. So, so we hope that uh, out of this clarion call, we'll then see a resuscitation of that activism where people will want to start playing their part by discovering their own mission as this young generation of today. Yeah. Absolutely. So before you get out of here, where can our listeners actually learn more about you as well as the Pan-African La Library partners, partnering with SID, I'm sorry, and then also about being the country head? Uh, we, we have um, a Twitter handle, uh, which is brand underscore SA. Um, and then we have um, a website, which is brandsouthafrica.com. Yeah, and then of course, once you you get our Twitter handle, uh, there are also links to our Facebook page as well as our Instagram. Account. Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on our show at Afro Vibes Radio and just allowing us to highlight your black excellence and just mm -hmm. sharing some amazing history with us because mm -hmm. we have such a big African community here in Houston, mm -hmm. and I know this may resonate with a lot of them, and it may even be the first time that they're hearing information like this. So thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you tonight. I will be there to learn some great knowledge, so thank you, thank you, thank you. We highlight your excellence. Thank you so much. And thank you all for still tuning into The Blackout, shining a light on black excellence, activism, and culture with your girl Sequila on Afro Vibes Radio. Make sure to check out our Facebook and Instagram pages at The Blackout AVR. And to stay up to date on our previous discussions and future events, please visit Afro Vibes Facebook and Instagram at Afro Vibes Radio, Twitter at Afro Vibes Radio with an S. And lastly, listen to us online at www.afrovibesradio.com or simply download the Afro Vibes Radio app on the Apple or Google Play Store.